Hello and welcome to Table for Five with no reservations. Take a seat at the table for a fresh, sweet, salty, tart, and pleasantly bitter conversation. Thank you for taking a seat at the table. Today we're going to listen to our storytellers episode all about big feelings. Seated at the table with me today is Jamie Ramos. Hello. Rachel Flanagan. Hey. Tabitha Cabrera. Hello. Kim McIsaac. Hey. And I'm Jennifer Dunn. Let's take a listen. My Heart Took Longer by Jen Dunn. When I found out I was pregnant and having a girl, I had our whole lives planned. Manny's and Petty's sleepovers, all the fun things I did as a kid. I pictured our Christmases, our vacations. I pictured your graduation, your wedding, and my grandchildren. And then on a dark afternoon in February of 2012, our lives were forever changed. But were they? When I heard the word autism, I truly felt like your life was over. I've been honest, I've said that, but it couldn't have been further from the truth. Learning to navigate through this new life was, well, life-changing. And I've said it many times, I have fundamentally changed as a person. The things that used to matter don't. My priorities shifted. Things like my career, dating, and friends. All of it, it changed. And not for the worse, and not for the better, but for what should be. As we struggled through this journey, it took me a long time to realize our lives didn't change. You were always autistic. This was always you. It just took me a long time to get there. I've made so many mistakes trying to have the life I thought we would have, and many times setting you up to fail, and I'm sorry. It took me a really long time to accept this is our life, and it is our lives, and I couldn't be prouder of you and how far you've come. You've gone through a medication journey that I can only describe as extraordinary, and you survived. School, public school, was not meant for you. It is not designed for children like you. And in those dark days of school, you developed epilepsy. When I made the decision to pull you out of school and put you in a private center, everything shifted. Everything began to change for us. But more importantly for you, kiddo, you are thriving. You have a best friend. You go to movies with her. She comes over and plays games. We go to the mall with her and her mom. And you and I, kid, we get those manis and petties. We go for lunch. And we're doing all of the things I dreamed of. I'm sorry it took me so long to get here. You were always here, kid. It just took me a long time to catch up. My heart took longer to catch up. But I'm here, and I love you. You are the most amazing little human in the world, and I am so honored to be your mom. All right, kid, let's do this thing called life. You can learn more about Jen and her daughter, Kaya, at Keeping Up With Kaya on Facebook and Instagram. Also, check out keepingupwithkaya.com. A Thank You Letter to My Son by Kimberly McIsaac. Being an older brother to a sibling with severe autism has not always been easy. It's a job you never asked for, but you took with stride. At times it was very difficult, and that is putting it mildly. Thank you for loving your little sister wholeheartedly. You were her light in the darkest of times. When her life was filled with sensory overload, and nothing made sense to her little body, and she was completely overwhelmed by our world. When she would lash out and hurt you just for saying my name and I would have to send you out of the room for your safety, you never got mad at her and you always adored her. Thank you for letting her follow you around and always being there to hug and tickle her, whatever made her happy. For getting down on the floor with her and playing her way. For connecting with her in any way that you could. Thank you for being a loyal big brother and always protecting her when others had no understanding of autism. For loving her and trying to reach her even when she seemed unreachable for never giving up and understanding that her brain worked differently and that it wasn't her fault. How could you understand this at five years old? I don't know how you could, but you did. You never stayed mad or blamed her. Thank you for being the happiest, easiest going little boy when my heart was breaking into pieces trying to come to grips with a life-altering diagnosis. For sitting with early intervention and helping them engage with her. For understanding that we couldn't go to play dates because our behavior was so unpredictable. For sometimes being disappointed but never taking it out on her. For understanding how much extra care and supervision she needed and never complaining. Thank you for going along with me when I needed that picture. You know, the ones where you had a smile for 15 minutes while I chased her and all but wrestled her down. Thank you for holding her so tight so I could get that picture while she was be trying to push you away, kick or roll over you. 
but you took it in stride. You couldn't have known how much it meant to me to get that picture. I just wanted a picture of my two beautiful children. I needed some kind of normalcy, even though it was anything but. There are a thousand examples of how things went awry. Things you lost out on, gave up, had to leave in the middle of. And yes, it was disappointing at times. But your love for her, your connection never wavered. I tried my hardest to make it up to you. I tried to spend more alone time with you. Have others take you so you could get a break. Bring you places, spoil you. You had every video game and Pokemon card that could be bought. Your nana, your grandpa, parents, and auntie saw it too. And they tried to make it up to you too. I am forever grateful for that as well. But how can you make up for a lost childhood for having to grow up too fast? You can't. I felt torn in two at times. My love for both of you is so strong, but her needs surpassed yours, and there was nothing I could do to change that. And then came your sisters, two girls, two years apart, a whirlwind, you could say. Again, you stepped up. Thank you. Thank you for bottle-holding, baby-loving, and all the madness that went along with it. And then things got a little easier, and you got to be a different kind of big brother. I read about special needs siblings. They are sometimes referred to as glass children. I thought that makes sense because you become so strong, but are also fragile. That is not the meaning of a glass child. It means that parents are so consumed with the special needs child that they look right through you and they don't even see you as if you were a piece of glass. I immediately thought, did I do that? Do you feel invisible? Like you didn't matter? I've handled a lot, but this I don't think I can handle. My mama guilt is coming on full force and I already carry so much. So I came to you and asked you, looking you right in the eye as I tried to hide the fact that my heart was shattering, again, even considering this. I asked you to be honest. I needed to know. You told me that you felt like you missed out on opportunities you could have had. If it wasn't for having a sister with special needs, that your life would have been different. I know this to be true, but it still hurt like hell to hear. But then you went on to say that it's okay, and it's not her fault, and it's not my fault. It's just what it is. Thank you for that grace. I cry as I read this because it feels like an impossible job to be pulled in two all different directions for all these years and feeling that I didn't get it right. There is no easy answer. Today it doesn't matter to you. Today you just love her for who she is, just like always. Today you make time to hug her, to make her laugh. Thank you for that. I know you don't need thanks or even expect it, but you sure deserve it. I am sorry that I couldn't always be the mother I wanted to be for you. That I was pulled into the uncharted waters of having a child with a disability, and some days I could barely keep my head above water. Thank you for being my life raft, even though that was not supposed to be your job. I know this has made you stronger and more compassionate. You are a better person for loving her, for having her in your life. Thank you for being the best big brother she could have ever had. The best son I could have asked for, and I love you more than you'll ever know. Love, Mom. To read more of Kim's writing, check out Autism Adventures with Alyssa on Facebook and Instagram, and AutismAdventuresWithAlyssa.com. The New Path Ahead by Tabitha Cabrera In June of 2022, I walked into a home I had purchased to do the final walkthrough before signing the paperwork. It had been months of planning selling our home in Phoenix, Arizona, and navigating how we would make the long trek north to settle into a place my children had spent limited time in. A place that was old to me and new to them. In that moment it hit me. This will be my house. My house with my kids. The we of our previous houses over the last two decades was not walking into this house. I would purchase new furniture and place all the items in the cupboards. I would make beds and tuck my kids in solo. As I walked through, I thought about Montana summers with a distinct fond memory of bonfires and woods surrounding me. And the moments when a guitar is pulled out of the back of someone's car and the acoustic sounds from the strings floated into a dark night surrounded by campfire. I hoped my children would enjoy Montana summers like this. I thought of the warm Arizona summer when the sky was filled with pink and red waves and the heat is almost too much to bear and my children growing up there. I thought about carrying our children through the door of our small three-bedroom first home with vaulted ceilings and the comfort of closeness. I thought of times in my life when change swept me up into a place I was unfamiliar As I walked through this new home, I was overcome with the past and the future. It melted into the air of the big changes on the horizon. It felt comfortable and also terrifying at the same time. There were moments in this life when the past and the future blast into the present, and the gravity of it all makes your heart skip a beat. Big feelings surrounded me 
as I thought about all the change that was coming, as I thought about how my children would handle the change and about how I would handle the quiet nights in a new home without the pitter-patter of little feet in the next room on nights when I was truly alone. I walked out knowing that this was part of where our future was heading. I wondered if we would be able to handle the new and saying goodbye to the old. After the move, I found myself closing doors to bedrooms when the feelings got too much to bear. I found myself unable to cook a meal strictly for one. I missed the space that was taken up by little people and the patterns we all knew so well. I missed the ease of a request for a break on the days when I was parenting as two. I was overcome with the what now, then how did this happen, and what am I going to do to move forward? How are we going to get through this big amount of change? Divorce is a word that immediately comes with questions. I was overcome with the questions, and my response at time curt to shield myself from the conversations that followed. I was attempting to understand the grief. I was trying to protect myself from going down a path that would lead to the inability to manage the day-to-day. I was overall walking around in a fog. As time has gone on, I have learned to appreciate the new, to give myself moments to bask in the surviving this time of my life, to celebrate the growth, to comfort my children during their times of feelings, and to be okay with feeling things to my absolute core. The thing about these feelings is that sometimes I truly don't understand what I'm feeling in the moment, or why it feels the way it does, and it can take weeks to understand where the feelings are coming from. There is no doubt that the second I walked into this house, it felt real. The new path ahead of me came into absolute focus, and the waiting for the change was over. You can find more from Tabitha at Peace of Autism on Facebook and Instagram, and at peaceofautism.com. My Deepest Fears by Jamie Ramos I stood alone on a dark bridge on a warm summer night. I listened to the creek below as it attempted to drown out the sound of my children and their cousin playing several yards away. We were at an unfamiliar park for a small family gathering. I left my two kids with my husband and some family to walk across the park and get some alone time. A rarity for any mother. As I wandered, I came across a bridge surrounded by tall trees which blocked out any streetlights. I walked halfway across and stopped when I felt a chill trickle down my arms and neck. It took me a second to realize that it was fear. I was frightened. Frightened as if something might jump up and grab me. As if something paranormal was right in front of me, cloaked in darkness. I chuckled to myself. Continuing to stand there frozen, I actually enjoyed the moment. That might sound insane, but it had been a very long time since I had felt scared in that superficial, perhaps unrealistic way. Ever since becoming a mother, my fears and anxiety have become massively palpable. No one properly warns you of the pure anxiety and worry that comes with motherhood. It is constant, unbelievably intense. It may not be that way for all mothers, but I know it is for me and many others. The moment my first child was born, something arose inside of me. A mixture of trepidation, unease, and mistrust in myself became all-consuming. This beast had risen in me here and there in the past as a big sister and as an aunt. I knew the beast sat within, but suddenly with my son's entrance into the world, it was permanent. That night on the bridge, I enjoyed that moment of fear because it reminded me of the girl who used to chase it. Before I had kids, I loved watching horror films and reading horror and suspense novels and short stories. When people would ask why, I would say I loved the intensity that came along with them. I would sit in a theater watching a scary movie or in bed reading a book surrounded by darkness on high alert. My whole body would be stiff. Every sound would make me even more tense. My eyes would want to close or hands close the book. It sounds strange, but I loved how it took a hold of me. It engulfed me in a moment of fear that affected my mind and my body. As I stood frozen on that bridge, the juxtaposition between the past and the present became plain. The recognition of that made me recall parts of who I once was and that now felt lost. It brought the realness to the anxiety and the visceral fear that comes along with being a mother. I have two human beings that I am everything to. Two people I must guide through this world. One of which is on a neurodiverse path that I must help him pave. They take up so much of me and although it comes on strong in the beginning, day by day I try my best to fulfill my obligation made from love. I hold so much for them in the ways of empathy and protection. 
The days of just worrying about my fate, my failures, my triumphs, and my feelings are long gone, maybe even too far gone, to the point that I really hadn't been thinking of myself at all. My time on the bridge lasted all of five minutes, but in that time, I promised to find some of the old me that I missed. Find the girl who dreamed, explored, created, and wandered. I also laughed a little at how I used to chase fear just to feel, and now all I do is fiercely feel everything in the ways of empathy, worry, and love. Suddenly, I heard my children coming closer and turned away from the darkness and steady sound of the water below me. I chose to turn towards them. The superficial fears would have haunted me for days in the past, but the love I felt eclipsed it in seconds. I walked away appreciative of that taste of reflection and a visit from the ghost of my past self. To read more from Jamie, check her out at Jamie Ramos Writes on Facebook and Instagram, also at jamieramoswrites.com. A Letter to the Parents of the Other Learners by Rachel Flanagan, read by Jen Dunn. We received Celie's IEP on Friday evening, and as I turned to page 4 of 16, I read, The IEP team has since agreed to make the referral to Federal 4 programming. My heart skipped a beat. While some parents are fighting for inclusion at the least restrictive environment for their littles, I have found myself in an atypical battle for an appropriate fit. It has been years, spanning countless transitions and combinations of therapies. There was no such hope. Each time we would layer not enough on top of not enough, praying it would become the combination that would make safety and learning a sustainable possibility. It just never was. Each time, one by one, all of the layers would fall apart. As I read Federal 4, my eyes filled with tears. My chest grew heavier by the second while my brain was reminding my heart that this is the first real step toward progress, not just another sidestep or stumble backwards. I wish I would explain this to the other parents that have their kids in placements and classrooms over the years with my girl. I wish I could tell them how hard we are working to keep their kids safe, safe from the books, chairs, or desks flying, or the curly-haired girl charging a teacher, toppling anyone or anything over in her path. I wish I could hand deliver a hug and offer a conversation, but I can't begin to think of how to accomplish that. As an exhausted caregiver, it's terribly hard for me to maintain connections or even establish them. Either way, I have no idea who the parents are, but I sure would like to talk to them. Here is what I would say. Dear parents, we have just completed the 18th week of school. I figured it was time to connect. Perhaps this note from our family would help you to understand a few things your children might be talking about from school over the past few weeks. I am Rachel Flanagan. My daughter, Seely, is a second grader at your child's school. She is a big energy, wicked fast, very friendly, and exceptionally social girl. When we moved to the area and started school, Seely was so excited about her experiences with your kiddos. She refers to your children as the learners, her friends, and though she might never be able to learn their name, many of your kids probably know hers. Seely bops into other people's space, and she might decide that she has something incredible to share, demanding all of the attention. It might be a fact about dinosaurs if she sees one on someone's shirt, or about mermaids if she sees one on someone's water bottle. Seely is the first to hug a friend in need. She is often the quickest to help a teacher or grown-up when they need a handout. She has these tight relationships with the adults in the school because she leans to them to help her regulate her body and mind throughout the day. At age four, Celie was diagnosed with autism and combination ADHD. When she was five years old, she was diagnosed with anxiety and depression. We also joined forces that year with an incredible doctor who told us her suspicion of fetal alcohol exposure. As a six-year-old, Celie's diagnosis of depression turned to bipolar two with rapid cycling. It was confirmed two weeks ago that Celie does have brain damage from prenatal drug and alcohol exposure. I tell you all of this to make clear that as a family, with every single update we have asked, we have battled for the right support to keep our kids safe. Celie is in the Federal 3 program at the school. She goes from classroom to classroom to classroom. The program's focus is on inclusion and meeting the needs of children with autism. Students in the class like these often go between a special education program and mainstream classroom, and many join the larger group for specials. This is a life-changing opportunity for many children that need more help to learn than a typical child. 
We have known that Celie's complexities require even more support, and we understand that having her included in your children's class has possibly come at a cost. We know that when your child has to evacuate a classroom, it's for their safety from my daughter's inability to get calm, remain safe, or become regulated enough to be moved to a safer place. We understand that there have been many moments where learning isn't possible for your child because ours is having a meltdown that requires all staff to keep Sealy, your student, the paras, and the teachers safe. If you've called the principal and heard that he can't answer your call at the moment because he is tending to an emergency, it's likely he's helping our student. Lord knows I've called in the past two or four weeks, and it's likely you've had to leave a message. We are sorry for staying so long, and we are sorry that so much is being risked while we wait for transition to happen. We know that inclusion is the goal for many, but understanding love and learning is an option for all of us. My husband and I invite you to learn with us because a girl with the bright shoes and the big hair who throws the books and hides in lockers is a mover and a shaker. We will get safety dialed in. You'll want to see the incredible ways she will change the world. She has taught me so much about life and how to find the magic while you are living it. I am just sure you'd adore her at hello. For more from Rachel and her family, check out Flannaville on Facebook, Flannaville 3 on Instagram, and flannaville.com. Thank you for joining us today for our Big Feeling Storytellers episode. Join us next time for no reservations. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you for joining us at the table for this episode of the Table for Five No Reservations podcast. We have new episodes every Monday. If you'd like to become a supporter of our podcast, please check out the link at the bottom of this episode's description. Please make sure to follow, rate, and review us wherever you listen. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram for more content. We also now have a newsletter. Check the description for where to sign up. Thank you for sitting with us at the table. See you next Monday.